thank you all for your practice. <clears throat> okay, so tonight I want to talk about a topic that I feel like I mention a lot. You know, it's pretty key to this practice, but I've never actually given a specific talk on this topic. So tonight I want to talk about renunciation. Renunciation. <laughs> Renunciation basically means just letting go of the things that are cause that cause us suffering, right? You know, like attachment to material possessions, people, um, destructive habits. Uh, but don't worry, you don't have to go like all bald and robey and and like go you know join a monastery or anything to practice renunciation. Like you can do this practice in your own life without having to go take up robes or anything. And uh, you know, it's like that feeling when you finally delete that that toxic X's number out of your phone. You're like, oh, Jesus, thank God. That feels so much better. It's like this instant wave of relief that just washes over you. Uh, you know, I, I know, I know what you're thinking, right? Like, you know, but I, I you're like, I, I, but I love Starbucks and I love mindlessly scrolling on TikTok for hours on end, right? How could I ever live without those things? Uh, I promise you, you can and you don't necessarily have to give those things up. Um, you know, because renunciation is a, it's a gradual process. It's nothing that you have to commit to overnight. You don't have to quit anything cold turkey. I mean, unless it's like severely harmful to you. And then it might be good to quit that cold turkey. You know, it just might be a good idea. Um, but, you know, maybe just try switching to decaf or setting a time limit for your, your TikTok scrolling. Uh, so I want to talk about what renunciation is, uh, some different types of renunciation, offer some personal reflections of my own experience with renunciation, uh, and finally, why it's so important to this practice and life in general, and how we can go about doing it. Sound good? Cool. Okay, renunciation is a term that's often associated with monasticism, but it's actually relevant to all of us. Uh, in Buddhism, it means letting go of our attachment to things that cause us suffering. And again, this can be things like material possessions, harmful habits, toxic relationships. It's like decluttering our lives, but on a deeper level. Which, God knows, my life was cluttered as shit at one point. It took a lot of renunciation to get to even this far, uh, like being a normal human being. <laughs> uh, you know, I used to really enjoy my bad habits quite a bit. And I had a lot of them, <laughs> quite a lot of them. Um, but the truth is that renunciation can actually be pretty liberating. You know, it's, it creates space for new experiences and opportunities and kind of like allows us to open our lives up to these experiences and opportunities. And we can ultimately just stop the cycle of craving an attachment that ultimately leads to suffering. Uh, Joseph Goldstein said that renunciation means letting go of the things that prevent us from realizing our true nature. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but Joseph Goldstein said it, so I imagine it has some truth to it, right? Uh, Joseph Goldstein is a really well-known Buddhist teacher. He's one of the, the first wave of Buddhist teachers that kind of brought the practice to America in a popularized way. Um, so... I'd like to talk about some of the different types of renunciation that we can practice, and uh, yeah. So uh, let's start with the easy one. Um, addiction to substances. Um, you know, renouncing substances that cause us harm, you know, like smoking or alcohol. Um, in my case, heroin was a big one for me. Probably the biggest one that caused me a lot of harm. Uh, that was a pretty hard one to renounce because it had this level of uh, dependency attached to it. It wasn't so much a psychological craving, but a physiological craving. Uh, I could not function as a person without it. I couldn't function with a person with it either. Just so, for not you know, in case I was unclear about that, so I don't go do the heroin, basically, is uh, if I had to sum that up in a, a short sentence. Um, and I really enjoyed heroin. I'm not going to lie. It was... It's not addictive because it sucks, you know, and uh, it really did. Uh, it actually helped me get through some really tough times. I think drugs and alcohol actually saved my life in a way. 
I, I might have killed myself if it wasn't for drugs and alcohol, for being really honest. So I kind of, you know, have to give a shout out to drugs and alcohol, and you'll never hear me do that very much, but I, I have kind of a big <laughs> shout out to drugs and alcohol for preventing me from committing suicide when shit was really dark. Um, but, you know, like I said, it, it was a gradual process. Um, I, I went to treatment a couple times. It, I was clean for like two years and then uh, I relapsed um, and then went back out for like three months and uh, had to check myself into treatment again. And so, uh, but that time it stuck. Yeah, thank God. But uh, yeah, it's a gradual process, you know. You don't, like I said, you don't have to quit cold turkey unless it's fucking heroin. And then you probably want to quit cold turkey because it's not a gradual process. There's no successful way to wean yourself off of heroin. Trust me, I've tried. I've done the fucking experiments. It doesn't work. You have to lock you in a box for X amount of time to get that shit out of your system. And that's the only way it works. Uh, but with other things like, say, uh, vaping or alcohol or, I mean, even, even alcohol can be hard to quit you know, hard to wean off of, but uh, I feel like we can, if we can start cutting back on the amount that we use, you know, the amount that we smoke or drink and just see how it feels and kind of go from there, right? Uh, I know one thing that really worked for me was just replacing uh, my, my destructive habits with constructive habits. So when I was first getting into recovery, uh, one of the big things that I leaned on a lot was exercise in the gym. And I still go to the gym every day. And, you know, I caught a lot of shit for that. Oh, you're just replacing one habit with another one. And, yeah, that's true. But, you know, one's killing me and one is probably going to help me, like, extend my life. So, fuck you to everybody that said that. Um, yeah, it's a, it was a bitch. You know, renunciation from substance use was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. But at the end of the day, you know, substance use... Uh, it, it prevents us from being who we are. You know, we, when we have this layer of I mean, adulteration over our minds all the time, it just prevents us from, you know, realizing our true nature. So I guess Joseph Goldstein was right, after all. <laughs> uh, Alan Watts said that renunciation is the realization that the happiness we seek cannot be found in external things. How many of you seek happiness in external things? Yeah. Yeah, I think we all do, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but the only real true happiness has to come from within, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and that sucks because the world is a smorgasbord for addictive behaviors and external things. There's plenty of stuff out there to cling to, plenty of stuff to get attached to if we want to. Uh, another thing that we really should work on renouncing if we're serious about our spiritual path is uh, harmful actions like lying or stealing. And I know none of you have ever done any of those things because you're all perfect angels. But again, uh, big liar, big thief over here for at least a few years. I would steal the shirt off your back while you were wearing it and sell it back to you just to get a fix. I would sell my own mother to get a fix at one point. Um, but seriously, you know, sometimes we engage in behaviors that, that harm ourselves and others without even thinking about it. Uh, we don't even realize we're doing it at the time. You know, so it's important to use this, this practice of mindfulness to bring this, this awareness to the self and this just have self-awareness for fuck's sake. Like, how many people have you met in your life that are completely, like, unaware of, their, of themselves? Like, they're just on autopilot. And they're like, I just am who I am. Like, fuck that. That's a cop-out. Anybody that says, I am who I am, that's an excuse. <clears throat> and it's not one that I accept anymore. There was a time when I used that shit, too. And I don't, not anymore. Uh, but, yeah, because with every action, there's, there's a reaction. With every action, there's consequence. Actually, you know, karma or comma just means action. And so with every action that we, we put into the world, there is going to be some repercussion from that. There is going to be a karmic fruit from that action. And so, you know, if we are in the habit of committing destructive actions, but well, we're going to get destructive reactions. If we're tearing things down, they're going to continue to fall. If we're building things up, they're going to continue to be built up. So 
you know, what do we do about harmful actions? Again, first of all, realization of self and knowing that we're doing it. Like, if you don't know you're doing it, there's no way to stop from doing it. So mindfulness, bang, boom. Big winner again, mindfulness with the win. You know, we can realize that the shit we're doing is actually harming ourselves or harming others. You know, it's, uh, we have to acknowledge that we're engaging in harmful actions that we want to stop them. And we have to know. And it's not always easy to admit when we fucked up, right? Yeah, but it's the first step in making things right. Yeah, and then we can take steps to change our behavior. And we, you know, we may need to apologize to people that we've hurt. We may, may need to, if you're from the twelve step rooms, make uh, like amends. That's something that I've had to do a lot of, a lot of mending some fences, and uh, you know, making amends to myself too. You know, I think the person I harmed the most in my addiction was myself for sure. You know, just bringing this this aspect of mindfulness to our actions. You know, we can we can begin to see the change. We bring this level of self awareness, and we can actually start to watch our behaviors and go, oh, maybe that's not exactly skillful. Uh, what what else? Harmful behaviors again, like. Procrastination and perfectionism. Do I have any procrastinators in the room? Hey. Any perfectionists in the room? Hey, all right. Yeah, you too. You're not alone. Uh, you know, then these might not seem as harmful as like stealing or, or smoking crack, uh, but they can still hold us back and cause us unnecessary stress. You know, so, how do we practice renunciation from these kinds of behaviors? Again, well, first we have to have the awareness to recognize that we are doing them. And not bullshit ourselves, right? I'm a classic bullshitter. I will bullshit myself into stuff all the time. Or at least I used to. I'm not, not so bad about it anymore. Um, you know, once we can recognize these, these habits like procrastination, uh, perfectionism, you know, these weird little defects of character, you know, we can start to actually address them. Uh, we can start to work on changing them. And that might involve, again, you know, setting up new habits and new routines. I've heard the, I can't remember who said it, but, you know, happiness is just a, a, a series of, like, healthy habits. So we're just taking, uh, we bring this level of self-awareness to the destructive habits and we create constructive habits. You know, if we're prone to procrastination, we might need to set specific deadlines for ourselves. That's something that's helped me a lot. Or, you know, break the task down into some like smaller, more manageable pieces so that we don't get so overwhelmed that we just don't start in the, you know, to begin with. Uh, if we're perfectionists, we might need to learn to accept that everything is not going to be perfect. Ever. Like nothing will ever be perfect. It will never be the way we want it to be. It will never be exactly the way we want it to be. I, I'm a musician. And I've put out a couple albums uh, many years ago. But I remember sitting and, and recording and like, I would like record the same fucking guitar part like 80 times and then use the first fucking take I recorded because I'm an insane person. And I'm like, oh, it's gotta be perfect. It's gotta be perfect, but it will never be perfect. Ever. So, and it's, and it's okay to make mistakes. Like you're gonna, we're gonna make mistakes. I make them all the time. And I've had to learn to forgive myself for making mistakes. It's a deep level of forgiveness. Uh, another thing that we can renounce, relationships. That's a fun one, right? <clears throat> it's kind of the tough, tough stuff there, the rena renouncing relationships that are harmful or toxic. Again, <clears throat> awareness. Even knowing that the relationship is toxic or harmful. And that can be a really difficult thing to do. You know, especially if we're attached to someone. Or if we've been in a relationship for a long time. You know, we have this history with the person. But sometimes, you know, staying in a toxic relationship can cause more harm than good. Um, I actually just 
had to uh, tell my significant other that I feel like we need to take a break for a while because we were both exhibiting some pretty toxic behavior. And I was really fucking hard. And I've been with my partner for four years and I love her tremendously. There's a lot of history and a lot of love there. But I know that if this relationship is going to survive, that I had to step away from it, which sounds completely counterintuitive, right? But, uh, you know, we've both got some work to do. I know I do. Uh, you know, so how do we practice renunciation in rela- harmful relationships? Well, it's not just as simple as just cutting ties, you know. We can't just cut people out of our lives. I mean, we can, but I don't rec- really recommend that because it's not really getting to the root of the problem. You know, again, it, you know, we have to have this awareness that it, that it's causing us harm or causing the other person harm and, and holding us back. And that might involve, you know, setting some boundaries, seeking professional help, counseling, and having difficult conversations that we don't necessarily want to have. Like, hey, I, I think we need to take a break for a little while. Yeah, that was, a, that was a tough conversation. Ultimately, the goal is to let go of the attachment. You know, that we have to the relationship and to move on in a healthy way. That's the goal. It's not easy, but it's absolutely essential for our well-being. Um, Some other things that we should probably work on renouncing if we're serious about uh, our mental health and our spiritual practice is, you know, things that cause us harm like negative self-talk and excessive worry. Then I was, again, I was really bad about both of those for a long time. I would, nobody's, nobody has ever said more insulting things to me than I've said to myself. <laughs> Anybody relate with that? Right? Yeah, I think we all just shit talk ourselves incessantly. And fucking stop it. Don't do that. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you, like, I don't have any, like, like cool advice other than don't fucking do that. That's not okay. Guns, yeah. Cool. Hey, like like the Fonz. Yeah. That would make it way cooler. Yeah. Everybody knows the Fonz was cool, right? You remember in Pulp Fiction at the end, he's like, then the the diner scene, he's like, we gonna be like three little Fonzies in here. <laughs> what was Fonzie like? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's still on topic for sure. Um, like I said, these things might seem small, but they have like huge impact. You know, just this negative self-talk has such a major impact. You know, we're telling every, with every negative thing we tell ourselves, we're programming our mind to believe it. And that shit will destroy your mental health. It did for me. That's ultimately one of the reasons I, I had a lot of addiction problems. You know, again, guess, guess what we use for this? Self-awareness, right? Yeah. It seems to be a common theme running through this talk. Mindfulness and self-awareness. So once we're aware of these negative thought patterns, we can kind of pump the brakes on that. Yeah, this might, again, involve mindfulness. Uh, journaling is another thing that really helps with this um, to help us identify these patterns. That's like one of the things that journaling is the best for is like you can look at times in your life when you were going through similar stuff and see the causes and conditions that led to you feeling the way you were feeling and then cut that shit out. Uh, you know, we're always building new sankara or these habituated patterns. You know, so with mindfulness, we can see the patterns that we're building and then we actually have the option to do something about it. You know, we can see the patterns that we're building and we can either uh, work on constructive habits or destructive habits. Because once we recognize them, we can work on changing them. You know, this might involve practicing self-compassion or gratitude, seeking support from others, uh, you know, to help us shift this mindset. You know, um, therapists, coaches, things of that nature. Uh, the goal is to let go of things that hold us back, again, to cultivate a more positive and compassionate outlook on life. So you know, we're really paying attention to whether our actions align with our values. It's like fucking cognitive behavioral therapy, basically. That's what this whole practice is, is like, do our actions align with our values? 
The Buddha was really just a radical psychologist. That's all he was. Yeah, um, we're, we're identifying what are known as the five hindrances. You know, uh, has anybody heard the five, the five hindrances before? So the, these five hindrances are craving, aversion, lethargy, restlessness, and doubt. And all of these will fuck your life up and cause a lot of suffering. Um, doubt's probably the worst one, self-doubt. Doubt in the teachings, doubt in the practice, self-doubt. Uh, in the Majima Nikaya, it says that not without abandoning these five <laughs> things can one become a monk, a son of the Sakyan. Which five? Sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry and doubt. Okay, so now that I have officially identified many things that we probably should renounce if we want to live happier, healthier lives, uh, you might be wondering, why fucking bother? You know, why put all this effort into letting go of things that we enjoy or that are familiar to us? And I guess the truth is that renunciation uh, is, as I said, it's essential for our spiritual growth and our well-being. You know, by letting go of our attachment, we create space for new experiences and opportunities. And we break free of this cycle of craving and attachment that just leads to suffering. We cultivate this sense of inner peace and contentment that can't be found in material positions or external achievements. And I'm still, that's still a lesson I'm learning. I'm still Mr. Like overachiever guy. Like I want to do all the things. Like I want to get the degree and I want to be the Dharma teacher and I want to do these things, but all that shit's empty. It's all fucking empty at the end. None of that shit matters. None of it. What matters is this. This right here. That's all that matters is your heart. You know, uh, Thai forest monk and teacher Ajahn Shah said that renunciation is not a rejection of the world, but a recognition of its impermanence. You know, when we place our happiness on conditioned external things in the world that are subject to decay, subject to death, subject to impermanence, what does that say about our sense of happiness? Also going to be impermanent. You know, so when we accept the impermanence of things and let go of our attachment to them, we can experience a sense of joy that is not found anywhere out here. Again, it has to come from within. And so how do we go about practicing renunciation in our daily lives? What can we do to get the ball rolling? Uh, start small. Obviously, you know, you, when you, if you start going to the gym, you're not going to go in and deadlift 500 pounds at the first day. Start small, you know, maybe start with the five pound weights. You know, start with one thing that you're willing to let go of and see how it works. And just find one habit that you feel isn't beneficial to you and just see what just cutting back on it does. See how your life improves from that. Be gentle with yourself. You know, renunciation can be a difficult process. And it is okay to slip up and make mistakes on the way. As I said, perfection is not possible. But you know, the trying, just giving it the effort, means more than anything. If we're not trying, then we're not going to get anywhere. Um, seeking support from other people, you know, talking to friends, family, therapists, coaches, you know, about the struggles that you're going through and, uh, you know, and the struggles that you're having with letting go. You know, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do any of this shit alone. That's why we're all here. That's what this word Sangha means. Sangha means community. That's why we take a refuge in the Sangha. Because you know, this this process of of insight and and this kind of getting to the core of who we are, it's hard and it's ugly. You know, meditation is not all white fluffy clouds. It's not all relaxation and joy. When you're serious about this practice, some ugly shit is going to come to the surface, and 
and, and you need people to lean on. You know, practicing mindfulness is you know, paying attention to your thoughts, and your emotions, and behaviors, and how they relate to your attachments. You know, this can help you identify the areas where you probably need to let go. Cultivating gratitude is another good way. You know, just focusing on the things that you do have rather than the things you're giving up. You know, gratitude can help shift your perspective and make renunciation feel less daunting. And remember your intention. You know? Keep in mind why you're practicing renunciation in the first place and how it will ultimately benefit you in the long run. Especially when it comes to like destructive habits. You know, if you're vaping or something, that's probably not as bad as if you're mainlining heroin, right? So like pick and choose your battles. Probably need to address the big ones first and then work your way towards the smaller ones. Uh, yeah. You know, renunciation is an essential part of the Buddhist path. And it involves letting go of our attachments to things and people and behaviors that no longer serve us. And, you know, as I said, it can be a difficult process, but it can also lead to a sense of freedom and inner peace that just can't be found in material possessions and achievements. You know, so whether you're practicing renunciation from substances, actions, behaviors, relationships, or things that ultimately would cause you harm, just remember, you know, to start small and be gentle with yourself. And don't try to do it alone. And that's why they have sponsors in the 12-step programs. Because you can't do this shit alone. You know, the Buddha said, peace comes from within. Do not seek it without. And by practicing renunciation, we can cultivate this inner peace and contentment that will serve us on our spiritual journey.